I'm gonna expose the mistakes that I have made today. I'm gonna talk about maybe why I did or what I obviously do differently now, just so that maybe you don't make those mistakes and also to dispel the idea that it's not okay to talk about your mistakes. Mistakes are how you learn. You're never gonna be perfect. You are going to make mistakes and you're going to move forward. The first mistake that I personally made was getting into the wrong type of feeding routine and even like the way and type of prey that I was giving my ball pythons. Being a snake breeder, you very quickly need to understand the circle of life. Rats are going to lose their lives whether you're giving them frozen thawed or live. But I wanted to start with frozen thawed because I didn't want to kill rats and it was going fine. I was feeding frozen thawed, my first snake ate fine on frozen thawed. Then I made the decision I wanted to dabble in breeding. I was going to start kind of small and just kind of work my way up in there, but my start was a bit accelerated. Let's just say that I bought established adults and these established adults had a expectation that was given to them and that expectation was live and I was told this. I was prepared and I tried to start feeding on frozen thawed and surprise surprise that did not work. So I then changed it so I would only do live for certain snakes and frozen thawed for others is what my preference was going to be. And that worked for a little while. But as I kept growing, I started to run into not only a time management problem, but a problem feeding my animals. Not all of them would eat unless I fed live. They would take better. They would not skip as much when I fed them live versus frozen thawed. It became to the point where I would thaw out a bunch of rats spending a decent amount of time doing this and have wasted a bunch of these rats. So to try to avoid wasting these frozen thawed rodents, I started to thaw only about half of what I would technically need. And when one turned its nose up at it, I would offer it to another one. This worked sometimes until it didn't because then suddenly they'd all want to eat. So now I have to go spend more time thawing out another 10 and then all those eat. And then I thaw out the other five and then let's just say none of those eat. It's just so incredibly frustrating. So why not just feed live? Because when the live one doesn't eat, I can just put it back in a home. This is how I started breeding rodents as well, because just had to have them on hand. Might as well start breeding them to save myself some money. I do keep on stock some frozen thawed, mostly very small ones for if I do ever have to assist feed any of my hatchlings, but most of my snakes are all on live. But that's only one part of the feeding routine. The other part was that I somehow thought it was a good idea to split it into two days. As I started to grow and I got my first set of hatchlings and whatnot, I thought maybe that it would be a good idea to feed the hatchlings on a weekend and my adults on a Wednesday. I don't know what made me think to this day that that was a good idea. I think it was just because I thought I would be taking more off my plate just one day. Just say, oh, I only have to do a little bit of it here and then I'll split the load between two different days. It's best to just get it all done with. Now I just feed on Mondays unless a special circumstance for some reason. The next mistake that I made was one that everyone is going to make and that I probably will maybe make again. And that would be impulsively buying an animal. I wouldn't say that this mistake has ever really bitten me, but I brought in some animals that I probably would have gone a different direction had I thought and researched on. I bought from different sources that probably I should not have bought from as well. I got a normal female, which we still have here to this day, and she's gorgeous and she's throwing some funky babies out and whatnot but I wouldn't say that that was necessarily a bad purchase. She cost very little for me. It was somebody who was getting out. We also bought another male who is no longer in my collection. I mentioned that I got into it small, but small for me was still a big jump into it. It was just, I wanted to go. I wanted to breed. I was impatient. I had done all my research. I was confident and I had raised a bull python for a while. So I knew their care very, very well, but I wanted to get into it. But the other ones that I had brought in, some of them were more established and some of them were not. Some of them I have rehomed before I ever even bred them. So I made some impulsive buys. It never really came to bite me though. And now I spend more time cultivating a plan of some sort. Planning is very important if you're going to actually breed. If you're just getting a pet, the only impulse buying that you should have to worry about is making sure that you have the setup. But if you are a breeder, if you're planning to breed even small time, you shouldn't just throw two things together. If you're spending all this time and effort to breed, go for some simple combos. Don't just throw two normals together or anything like that. It's not going to cost you really much more, if any, more at all. And I kind of was just any opportunity I could to get cheap stuff that was established especially, I 
took that. But thankfully it did not bite me and I learned pretty quickly that I shouldn't do that. And on that topic, one other mistake I made was of those buys, I bought too many proven breeders. Most of the proven breeders that I bought are no longer with me. Most of them I just moved on from, sold off because they didn't fit my plans anymore. I just bought stuff that was established that I thought I could get eggs out of. I just wanted to produce. But I risked things that I didn't think about. For one, if you don't research the gene, you could risk certain genetic defects, which we talked about in our last video, or even lethal combos. Now I had researched, I made sure that 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 wasn't the case, but I really came close to a couple issues. When I was very first starting out, we did get mites, but I only had this one first rat. So it was very easy for me to clean it up. And now I am uber paranoid about mites. But the other thing is to make sure you trust your source for where you're bringing it in, because I very narrowly dodged a bullet. I brought in a snake for all intents and purposes I thought was healthy. Shortly after, within a couple weeks, I started to have concerns around this animal, um, possible respiratory infections and whatnot. And the biggest mistake that I made here, quarantine your animals when you get them new, especially if you don't know the source. I did not do this because I had a smaller collection and I just didn't think about it. I had assessed the health of the animal. It looked healthy. I had seen this animal multiple times and I was wrong. Thank God my other animals did not get sick. I don't know how this animal was sick, but we were able to get past that. And eventually I didn't even breed her. It ended up being a big waste of money. So it might sound like I'm anti buying proven breeders. I, I am not. They're a great way to jumpstart yourself, but you got to ask the right questions. The most important one being, so why are you parting with this snake? Selling an animal that's just going to produce an average of six eggs and make you money doesn't make sense, right? That's why you should ask questions because usually what they'll tell you is, hey, I'm moving in a different direction. I have replaced the snake with one with better genetics. These are valid reasons. If they're dumping things to get out of the hobby, that's technically valid too, but you need to ask health questions. Uh, what are they eating? How frequently? Any issues? Because often animals that are sold even in the best of situations are doing this because maybe they are moving in a different direction and they don't have the room and they've replaced it with an animal. But there are other reasons. Maybe this animal produces a higher amount of slugs. Maybe it's never actually successfully bred for them. This is stuff you need to find out, hopefully, before you purchase. The next mistake I made to a lesser extent, but I still did, was leaving them the heck alone. As in, I didn't leave them the heck alone. I did not respect their privacy and it could affect their health and their desire to breed. It could affect their desire to eat. If you spook them, if you're always hovering over them and bothering them, if you always want to hold them, they're going to feel stressed. And now I interact with my snakes every day, but interaction does not need to involve touching. It does not need to involve holding them. I am making sure their water's good, making sure that I'm cleaning. I am inspecting for eggs. I'm inspecting for issues, but that doesn't always involve touching them. I do interact with them in that way too. I want them to feel comfortable around me. I want them to become tolerant of human interaction, but I didn't respect these animals' privacies and what they want is solitude for the most part. Honestly, they could do without us. And obviously we have to give them the care, but they could just say, give me my water, give me my food, go away. Now, do I think snakes can become tolerable? And do I even think maybe that they can enjoy your company or even love you? Well, I made a video on that subject if you want to see my opinion on that but I did mess with them a little too much nothing ever too bad but I probably was responsible for maybe one or two hunger strikes possibly quick one that I actually just recently needed to change and that would be what substrate I use now if you watch our videos you see for the most part we keep them on cocoa husk and then sometimes some of our tubs you see them on paper on, on towel why is it changing all the time well that has something to do with your climate and I needed to learn that because I kept them on cocoa husk forever and during the summer man it would get very swampy our room would get ridiculously humid that is because where where we live in the Midwest and Northwest Indiana, just a hair off of Lake Michigan. We are all about extreme weather. During the summer, our humidity is through the roof. But during the winter, our humidity is nothing. 
and it is winter right now and it sucks. It is very, very dry. So I had switched in the summer back to paper and I was just done with this crap. You get gnats and such like that in the summer. There's nothing, they're harmless, but they're obnoxious and this is my home. So I would rather not have gnats in the house. So when I switched, eventually we got rid of the gnats and everything like that. But then winter came along and then things started to dry up and I got a little bit of a not so good shed out of an adult. So I had to switch back. So depending on your personal climate, pay attention to how you want to keep them in terms of their humidity. Humidity doesn't need to be hard, but it does need to be done. Moving on to the last two points, which are pretty decent mistakes. The first one is probably one of the ones I'm most ashamed of. One of the snakes that I got as a proven breeder wouldn't eat for a little while. And I was super scared. They were a little bit skinnier male and it hadn't actually been that long, maybe a month and a half. I chose to assist feed an adult and you should never assist feed an adult. Hatchlings you might need to to get them to eat but the point of assist feeding is to get them eating themselves to get them into that habit. Adults have gotten to their size because they know how to eat. They had that habit. They're stopping eating for a different reason and sometimes they just choose to not eat. They know they don't need to. If they don't do much they will not lose much weight. You just need to provide them water and they are good for a very long time. Months maybe even the better part of half a year. But at the time I was super worried about this animal. And in my hubris, I assist fed it and um, it didn't go well, but I did get the very small rat pup down this bigger snake's throat. It basically was like feeding it a chicken nugget. So I doubt it did anything besides scare the animal from eating even longer. It was a big time screw up on my part. Don't assist feed an adult ever. If your snake is to the point where you think it's going to die from not eating, go to a vet because you've got something much worse wrong than it not eating. Something is causing it not to eat, whether it's stress or whatnot. You need to make the change, not the animal. It was still getting used to my environment and I was just so wanting it to thrive. I definitely am here to tell you right now, I don't care what the reasons are. Do not assist feed an adult. If it comes down to that point, you need to make changes and you need to go to a vet if it comes down to it being a sickness. I, like I said, feed on Mondays. I bring all my rats into the rooms and I had them open and I started feeding. I didn't think before doing this and didn't think about if I had certain snakes paired with other snakes. And I have one particularly interesting animal. Anubis here is a very, very kind, intelligent bull python. He really loves the ladies. He will lock anything you put him to and he eats like crazy anything you put in front of this dude, he will eat. I went to feed all of my animals. I'm going down the rack, opened one of the tubs and oops, I'd forgotten. That wasn't just the female. He was in there and he smelt the rats and I was prepared for him. We call him the jack in the box. Whenever it goes time to feed him, he shoots out. And I was like, uh, okay. So I put the rat back in the tub really, really quickly. And I grabbed him by the tail. The rat's tub was down there. He shot down and went towards the closest heat source he saw. I am very lucky to say he could have gotten a little too close for comfort to other regions. <laughs> and he thankfully just grabbed my shorts and then proceeded to wrap my shorts, holding them down, all to the delight of my brother who just laughed at me while I was quite literally being depanced by this snake. And that is the most embarrassing, foolish decision on my part that thankfully only cost me my pride. If you'd like to learn more about common mistakes you'll need to avoid as a bull python breeder, you can check out our video we did on that right here.